morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to uh, Populism event of uh, Association, uh, Freedom Research Association, and uh, our dear partners. Um, I'd like to briefly talk about uh, Freedom Research Association and uh, share with you what we have been doing in Turkey. <coughs> The Freedom Research Association uh, was founded back in 2014 with a group of classical liberal minded scholars, business people, and uh, researchers and journalists. And uh, it has the vision uh, of free and prosperous Turkey. Uh, what we are trying to create is a free and prosperous Turkey. And we strongly believe that this vision can be realized only in a liberal democratic polity. In such a polity, in the economic sphere, we believe that a free and competitive market economy creates the highest prosperity. And on the political field, it's a complementary, we believe that a constitutional democracy based on rule of law and free and fair elections provide the political answer. So such a concept, such a polity, a liberal democracy has been under attack in recent years uh, with a new menace, as my friend put it, which is populism. And we thought that as liberals, Turkish liberals, along with our European and American friends, liberal friends, friends of liberty, we should come together and discuss how the populists are exploiting some of the problems that we have in neglecting, perhaps, and what kind of communication strategies they are using, and what response, as liberals, we can uh, provide to them. So towards that purpose, we put together uh, panels through uh, with uh, with the support of esteemed speakers, and I I, I thank uh, thank all of them, each one of them, for uh, coming and for for sharing their thoughts with us. And I also would like to present our gratitude to our partners, uh, Frederick Nam Foundation, a, a long time partner, and and also International Democratic Initiative from Netherlands and also European Liberal Forum uh, and Atlas Network for their uh, both financial and also intellectual support. I hope that this uh, conference uh, will be a very productive one and we will be inspired at the end of the day uh, with <coughs> new ammunition to, to keep the flag of liberty and prosperity uh, higher. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, naturally, being in Turkey, I wrote my comments in Turkish, but I shall try attempt to read them in English nonetheless. <laughs> uh, populism, as we see today, is a very serious threat to liberal democracy and the most active vehicle of authoritarianism and the demand to weaken or eliminate uh, democratic institutions. Many serious analysts have focused our attention on reasons for the rise of populism, a topic we should discuss seriously. We heard some discussion uh, at the opening. I would like to supplement them by looking at populism as an ideology. It isn't something that just happens, like demographic change or budgetary crisis caused by unfunded liabilities. Although demographic change and budgetary crises can be used to fuel populist movements. The political scientist Karen Stenner, a very good book which I highly recommend, The Authoritarian Dynamic, uh, identified the conditions for the emergence of authoritarianism, and they track very well with contemporary populist movements. She posits that all of us have a predisposition to authoritarianism when we feel threatened. This is a natural part of human psychology. Some have more than others, but it can be triggered by what she calls perceived normative threats, threats to the homogeneity of the social order. As she shows threats to collective rather than individual conditions trigger what she calls 
authoritarian groupiness, the nice term. That is to say, populism. She doesn't use the word populism. A powerful threat to collective conditions is the identification of an enemy, which may be external or internal, ethnic or religious, and this is where populism as an ideology plays a key role. For many years, scientists, political scientists, have debated what is populism. In 1967, in a, uh, a colloquium in London, this was discussed, and the great political scientist Isaiah Berlin warned us. He said, well, a single formula to cover all populisms everywhere will not be very helpful. The more embracing the formula, the less descriptive. The more richly descriptive, the more it will exclude. Nonetheless, he identified a core populist idea, an ideological tenet. The idea at the core of populism everywhere in the world, whether it's the US or Germany or Turkey or Italy or Britain. The identification of the true people who have been, quote, damaged by an elite, whether economic, political, or racial, some kind of secret or open enemy, capitalism, Jews, and all the rest of it. Whoever the enemy is, foreign or native, ethnic or social, does not matter. But there must be an enemy. Now, not only can we find that these various populisms we witness today revolve around the creation of a distinction between the true people, the authentic people, and the anti-people, the un-people. There are ideologues who have articulated this as an ideology very clearly. Their books are virtually unreadable because they are typical academic extreme left post-Marxists. But if you torture yourself to read their books, what you find is really striking. Ernesto Laclau, one of the most prominent in his book, Unpopular Reason, identified the basic unit of political analysis as the demand. Not demand in an economic sense, which is a schedule of willingness to pay, yielding a negatively slow demand curve, as we're accustomed to, but something different. A demand for something regardless of cost. Just we want it, we demand. He differentiated democratic demands, which can be negotiated within democratic context with merely unmet populist demands. And what happens is that a populist leader assembles a collection of angry, unmet demands. They may have no coherent connection to each other. There is no principle that ties them together. They may range from free electricity to excluding immigrants, higher pay, persecution of minorities, whether they're Muslims or Mexicans or Syrians or Jews or whoever it is. Those collections are put together and he calls it through an equivalential articulation of demands. You make or create the people. None of these demands are connected, but they're unified by a leader. One person, using his impenetrable post-Marxist phrase, an empty signifier. What he means is the leader. Mussolini, or whoever it is, the leader who unifies all of these demands. Now, he's not just an obscure Argentine-British academic. He's very influential in Latin American populism, without any question, in Argentina in Bolivia, in Venezuela, also in Spain, Podemos Party of Spain is deeply influenced by Laclau's uh, thought. And Greece, Syriza Party, is a Laclau-style uh, political party. He has returned to the contemporary debate, a theory we found articulated by Carl Schmitt, the famous National Socialist uh, jurisprudence in Germany in the 1920s and after. Schmitt is often called the crown jurist of the Third Reich. And he's now become one of the most influential thinkers around the world today, on the far right and the far left. All of them have something in common. The concept of the friend-enemy distinction, which he put at the heart of his political theory. As he said, the specific political distinction can be reduced to that between friend and enemy. And Laclau and his wife Chantal Mouffe, a very uh, prominent British academic, have returned that to the center of political discourse. Also, the Marxist philosopher Slavoj Zizek, maybe he's known to some of you uh, as well, bases his social philosophy, what he calls the internal struggle 
that traverses the body politic and the unconditional primacy of the inherent antagonism as constitutive of the political. So liberals believe we should be able to find a way to live together. Schmidians do not. What we want to find, if we are Schmidians, is a way to destroy the enemy, to make the enemy impossible. We know how that turned out uh, in Europe in the 1930s and 40s. Antagonism is the fundamental notion behind it, and it is the key to understanding populism. Schmidt, uh, Laclau made it very clear. He said, in the case of populism, the people are constructed, are constructed by identifying an enemy. He called it a, a frontier of exclusion that divides society into two camps. Thus, the people is something less than the totality of the members of the community. It is a partial component which nonetheless aspires to be conceived as the only legitimate totality. So this is how the ideas of a Nazi ideologue have been reintroduced and are now dominating political discourse around the world. We create an internal frontier to distinguish the true people from the non-people, the un-people. Now, for Schmidt, the enemy was the Jews. This is the subtext for Schmidt's uh, writings, are very clear. But for Laclau, the enemy is anybody we choose to be the enemy. It doesn't matter. All we need is an enemy. In the Podemos party, Inigo Erevan, one of the founders of the party, put it very neatly. He said, the enemy is the casta, the privileged ones. He was asked, who are the casta? His response was, enlightened. The terms, quote, the terms mobilizing power comes precisely from its lack of definition. It's like asking who's the oligarchy, who are the people? They're statistically undefinable. These are the poles with the greatest performative capacity. Namely, it's useful to the seizure of power. Chantal Mouffe also put it very neatly. She said, by designating the enemy, we build the sort of people we want to build. So the people is constructed or created by the leaders of the populist party. The designation of a threatening enemy should be familiar to members of a Turkish audience. That there's an enemy always behind us that we have to struggle against. It's a very powerful tool for creating fear and fixation on the one great leader who will protect the people. And it's not unique to Turkey. Donald Trump refers to the media as the enemy of the people, a very chilling <coughs> phrase. In May of 2016, he said something, as like everything he says without thinking, he articulated the core idea of populism. Quote, the only important thing is the unification of the people, because the other people don't mean anything. It's a pure statement of populism. Nigel Farage. This will be a victory for real people. That is to say, the opponents of Brexit didn't just lose, they weren't real people to begin with. They're the enemy. And Hugo Chavez articulated the idea that it's the leader that represents the people. As he said, Chavez is not me. Chavez is a people. And here in Turkey, what did we hear? Who are you? We are the people in response to a uh, criticism. This puts the idea of democracy at complete risk. Populism is a democratic movement, but it will destroy democracy because it destroys the idea of the loyal opposition. The loyal opposition is a key element of democratic governance. The ability to say, well, we lost the election, we move into the opposition. Maybe we will win later. But if you are the enemy of the people and you lose the election, you are to be destroyed and annihilated. It ultimately represents suicide for democracy. And for that reason, we need to respond with an intelligent liberal response, not merely to social conditions, but to an ideology of pure power, violence, and hatred. politicians doing parliament, they are not supposed to talk for more than the time allocated for them. And my name is Zoltan, as it was mentioned, Zoltan meaning Sultan. It comes from the Turkish and Hungarian politicians are given uh, names like 
a ruler like Sultan or Victor Orban, Victor Victory, so that once you become a politician, you can you know, boast with your name. Now, it's a very valid question that you asked how <coughs> Hungary uh, became a black hole, sucking in individual freedom, civil rights, freedom of the press, how it became a very populous country in the past nine to ten years. Uh, I have to go back in history a little bit, well, not back to the Ottoman rule of 150 years uh, that we had, but go back a little bit to 1990 and the time before that. Uh, we have to know that in Hungary the transition, uh, how the transition, transition went in Hungary wasn't uh, the same as in other countries, because in Hungary the the, the communist terror was not as big as in, for example, Romania or the Soviet Union or Slovakia, the Czech Republic. So the immune system of those nations is, uh, I would say, much stronger against oppression than the Hungarians. Hungarians, for some reason, uh, experience the softer regime, softer Soviet regime, so freedom is valued less in Hungary. And this liberation to Hungarians was very inferior, and for some reason we never really appreciated the liberty, liberty that we were given after the Cold War. One other aspect, a historical aspect I have to mention, I'm going back to this a little more, is that during the Nazi times, during the communist times, uh, these regimes, I would say literally beheaded the property owning classes of society, which means that these, these people would have been a good base for a strong centrist uh, opposition to populism, but unfortunately we don't have that. Uh, an economic reason also led to populism. After the transition, Hungarians expected something grand, something great, which never came true. It never happened to them, so there was a big disappointment, and you know, they had this nostalgia towards communism, the Kadar regime, that, oh, everybody had a job, everybody, you know, could work, and this nostalgia also led to having the desire for a strong leader who would give answers to the simple problems that you had. So basically, we're coming to uh, the economic crisis at the end of the last decade, and this was the time, the good time, uh, for a person like Viktor Orban to appear on the stage. Actually, this was, uh, he had been prime minister before, but he could perfectly adopt to the disappointment of uh, Hungarians. And he seduced the whole nation with his populist promises, and now he's holding the whole nation uh, hostage. Now, what is the main principle of Orban's populism? And I think when we come to an event organized by the European Liberty Forum, we have to state that Orban himself, for Orban himself, ideology was never important. In the 1980s, he was a member of the Communist Youth Movement. At the beginning of the 1990s, he would have been sitting here at a very similar event because he was the vice president of Liberty International. Then he became a conservative between 1998 and 2002. And then he turned to national populism 10 years ago. So is ideology the most important for, for these populists? And I would ask Kaczynski's case in, in connection with Poland or Erdogan here in Turkey. I, I would say no. Ideology doesn't matter. What matters really is to keep power, to be in power. In 2002, Viktor Orban lost the election. And you know what he said? You only have to win once, but that one time, you must win by a lot. Because if you, if you win by a lot, you can change the electoral system, you can ch change the press. At present, in Hungary, the pro-government conglomerate owns 476 newspapers. In the countryside where I live, there is no independent radio station, there is no independent print newspaper, everything is pro-government. And just a, a very interesting uh, example from my campaign when I was campaigning last year, and last year I lost because I could not uh, stand against the whole media uh, pressure that I was facing. Uh, in, because there was, there was smear campaigns against independent and opposition politicians. Uh, just like, for example, probably here in Turkey as well. There was this uh, free Fides the government guy who gave a press conference that, oh, this is a photo proving that Zoltan was given 50 million forints for this and that and that. The problem is that it wasn't me in the picture. 
It was somebody else. <laughs> but people believed it. I went to a village to campaign, and there was this old gentleman, he said, but you were given 50 million foreigns. And I said, look, I lost my patience, and it shouldn't happen to a politician. But look, this is the picture. There are two people in the picture. Which one is me? I don't care, it was said on TV, he said. Do you believe the TV or your eyes? TV. <laughs> So that's why it's very important what these populists are doing, especially to the press, because this way the opposition and, and, and other thinkers don't have the chance to circulate their ideas. Also, very similar things like gerrymandering, setting up a mafia-like state, choosing the enemies who cannot fight back. In Hungary, we've, in the past decade, we've had different enemies, refugees, Western bureaucrats, uh, Claude Juncker, uh, George Soros, for example, is a Hungarian philanthropist, giving billions of foreigns to Hungarians. But still, these people were the enemies of the state, the enemies of the people. Now, uh, is there any hope to defeat these populists? Is there a way to fight them? I think one thing you have to understand very clearly is that uh, populists don't want peace. Populists want tension, they want war, they want conflicts, as we've seen in lots of different examples. And still I would say that the fight is not hopeless and there is, there is hope. Because, and I ask this many times when I talk about populism, and some, some of the time may, maybe only mentioned, or somebody, the liberal response to populism. Is there a liberal response to populism? Is there a conservative response to, uh, to populism? Or a socialist response to populism? I think one has to understand that the opposite of populism is neither of these things, neither liberalism or communism or socialism or conservatism. In my opinion, the opposite of populism is responsibility. It's individual responsibility that we for, for example, politicians or NGOs have to take. Because you know, populists are loud, they are very loud, and uh, they, you know, all you, all you can do is to, to, to work against them, and the important message is to work against them on the local levels. On the local levels, especially, I think I've seen the same figures from Poland and Turkey and Hungary and the United States, populists are very popular in in, in the countryside, in the rural areas, in the localities. So, so let's be honest uh, with each other, and I have two minutes. So, um, when you're a politician, you don't have to campaign only every four years or five years when a campaign time comes. You have to be present among the, be among the people and talk to them, listen to them, listen to their problems. Uh, in the past nine years, and so, sorry for blaming the Hungarian opposition, I, I didn't belong to any of the parties, but they had nine years to build up something, and they failed to do it. They had nine years to help the media, and they failed to do it. They had nine years to do something against the populist regime in Orban, and they failed to do it, because they only focused on the campaign time. They didn't care about the people. You have to talk about the people, you have to talk to the people. Uh, a very important thing uh, is that you have to help the creation of local papers. Uh, success story from what we did in the past one year with, I'm, I'm part of a new movement at the moment, and uh, we are also building some, uh, in, helping some independent media. In the past one year, we have set up 21 media outlets all around the country. These media outlets are actually read by more people than the pro-government media outlets. So this is, this is for everybody, I mean, everybody to do. Be there, be present, and, well, obviously, just checking my time, uh, obviously, uh, we, we must act together. We must help each other, we have to share the best, best practices that we have in each country, because this is how we will defeat the populace.